Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the People Process Progress Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Pinnell. This is episode 20, uh, The Logic of People, and we'll see why I'm kind of calling it that uh, here in a little bit as we talk more with my guest, Matt Schmidt, um, CEO of PeopleLogic.ai. And thank you again for everyone that's uh, listened, downloaded, subscribed. Please give us a rating out there. Um, you know, obviously, more stars is good. Um, help us bump up to the top and share more great stories like we're going to get today um, talking with Matt. And so today we'll learn about um, Matt, where he grew up, those kind of things. And Matt, thank you again for um, being on the podcast. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to, to speak with you this evening. No problem, Kevin. Thanks so much for having me. Cool. Um, so like I mentioned, we'll, let's, you know, the people process progress, right? So we'll learn about you uh, covering the people component, obviously a lot of process, which is great. I'm excited to have that conversation and share that um, with other people, um, all the processes you've been through and in and, and, and the industries that you've been part of. And then of course, share with folks uh, as we make progress. So kind of jumping into it, where, where are you from and where'd you grow up? Yeah, so grew up in eastern North Carolina. You know, North Carolina is one of those interesting states that has this island in the the middle between the beaches and the mountains, and everything in between is uh, farming country and is flat. And um, so I grew up in the farming country uh, and was driven to uh, build a you know to get into technology and and build a way to escape from. Uh, you know, the lack of, of technology and, and progress. And uh, so came up to, to the island here in Raleigh and uh, went to college at NC State. And uh, that really kicked me off in my, uh, my journey. Nice. Did you, so were you into, so you didn't have technology maybe a lot. Were you, were you excited about it or into it when you were younger? Like, did you enjoy like Atari or Nintendo or things like that? Did you have kind of a, you know, an attraction to that? And I may be dated. I'm 46, so I may be older than, older than you. No, totally, totally had, uh, had all those things. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had dial up internet and I can remember getting my first computer and being just, uh, intrigued by the potential of that and, you know, quickly taught myself how to program. And, um, that was really the, the first, you know, way to, to begin escaping and started helping people build websites uh, back when I was a teenager. And so yeah. that, uh, I've always had that sort of that entrepreneur draw, uh, yeah. ever since I was, uh, really young. And, um, that seems to have carried well for me. Did you, did you, um, get into any particular kind of code, you know, doing websites, begging the HTML or, or just kind of a little bit of everything? Uh, a little bit of everything early on, um, you know, heavily into HTML, uh, and, you know, even before this was, you know, before there was really CSS and, you know, l- early into JavaScript um, and then quickly into, you know, building programs in basic and uh, and then moving into languages like Java um, wow. as I as I taught myself more and more about how to program. It was really in the early days, it was really driven by. Um, you know, funny enough, uh, as I had a, a an early computer and we had this, uh, we had the dial up internet and I was really, one of the early things I was really driven by was, Hey, you know, we don't have Microsoft word. I really think I could build something like that. That was foolish of me in the oh, early wow. days. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but big, ambitious, big vision. ambition never, uh, I was never short on in my, in my youth. Man, imagine that with, uh, imagine right now what, you know, we're all going through with dial up of just, <laughs> <laughs> it's all, that, people don't understand the true pain. The, that is, uh, you know, when you had to have a separate phone line just so you didn't get kicked off. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that, uh, I, I think I told somebody the other day, God, if we had this, uh, pandemic during the, the eighties or even the, the early nineties, um, <laughs> how much worse it would be. And you didn't get your uh, free internet CD in the mail. And, man. <laughs> if you were trying to figure out how to get into AOL, right? That yeah. would be your... Uh, <laughs> It'd be a lot. Yeah. It would. It would. That's awesome. So uh, clearly that bug of doing that, making websites, um, got to NC State. And so did you major in computer science or a similar uh, major there? Yeah. So uh, I majored in uh, computer engineering and computer and electrical engineering because uh, foolish me, I thought I wanted to actually uh, build the the parts of the computer more than I wanted to program them. Oh, wow. Until I learned that I hated physics. Oh. Uh, and so, <laughs> so that uh, 
that really kind of pointed me, you know, I still went through with the, the computer engineering and the electrical engineering, but uh, was really focused on uh, programming and the more computer science aspect of it and was doing that all throughout college. And um, that was really where I found, uh, you know, got connected with my partner at D-Zone uh, long before it was called D-Zone. And, you know, we started to uh, build a business together. Oh, cool. So were you, you, you met at college? Yeah. So he had a, a business, uh, that was, had relocated from New York and was in, uh, carry and he was looking for, um, some people to join his team. And this was in, you know, I guess mid dot com crash, uh, oh, wow. era. And so, you know, I joined and, you know, everything, uh, plummeted as, you know, our customers lost their customers and so on. Um, and, we had this great website called Java Lobby and uh, we figured out how to sell ads around it. And that was really the start of it as we, you know, built some interesting technology and learned how to be publishers and uh, turn that into, you know, building one of the world's largest developer portals um, at d Wow. I mean, that's pioneering stuff, right? And then there weren't as many tools, right, to be able to, that kind of wrote a lot of scripts for you or helped you along? So did you all have to do a lot of, you know, just a lot of hours in front of the keyboard and, you know, mapping and, and work like that? Yeah, this was, you know, long before you could really, you know, there were, uh, you know, you had to build everything in those days. And so there were, you know, the early days of even things like Google AdSense and Google AdWords and those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we were, we had to build our own community software. Um, and so it just was, this was even probably before, this may have even been before blogs, but certainly before blogs became the place that everyone, um, tried to put their communities. Well, did you find, um, many like-minded and and skilled folks at school there, or were you able to, again, still pretty, I guess, early-ish days kind of reach out to other, were there user communities then that you all could, could kind of bounce ideas off each other as well? Uh, you know, so that's what we provided, uh, primarily. And so, you know, Java lobby had been started by my partner and, uh, as we scaled it, but in those days, you know, the, the developer world was much more fragmented and, uh, Java lobby really provided a place for, uh, developers to have an independent voice and an independent community that was separate from the vendors, uh, who were really controlling the messaging developer tools and, developer APIs in those days, um, which is, is somewhat different than, than what you get these days. And open source wasn't what it was, you know, what it is now. Um, it was a big deal if you were open source back then. So oh, okay. it, it, everything has sort of uh, come much further, much more quickly uh, than it was in those days. Did you um, run across other folks that, that also went on to kind of build products and, and put stuff out there that, that came through Java Lobby? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, you know, a lot of the, the people that we interacted with went on to to build uh, companies that went public or had great exits or, um, you know, people that you see in the news these days are um, were people that we that were part of the community and were part of that early Java community. And so that's it was an exciting thing to, to be a part of as we built out this place for uh, people to share their problems and share you know, what they were trying to build and be able to help each other and uh, get the word out about what they were doing. That's that's cool because it's such a, especially then, a niche and folks that really had to want to do that, I would imagine, right? To be involved and, and get in there and do that, not just as an entrepreneur to try and make a successful business, but that programming and that coding. And I, I dabbled a small bit in HTML mostly to make like a website because I was a PC gamer for... <laughs> For like, you know, the folks I played with. So, but understanding my wife did some coding and, and looking at it and man, it's, I was a, an old school crawling on the de- under the desk, like assemble and upgrade computers like that. But getting into the, the coding piece for me was, was pretty overwhelming, but also amazing. It, it's still amazing to me just that, you know, put these characters in there and it'll make all these things happen. And, and just, it, it sounds like to build that, put that community out there with such foresight was, was great and advantageous and, and helped a lot of people along the way. How, and, and so for me as an IT project manager, project manager in general, 
what kind of, just to touch on, on that bit, what kind of process did you all look at when you all got together and said, hey, you know, did, did you already know, hey, there's this, there's this need, we should give people this forum, this place to kind of talk code and, and do better? How did you all kind of pull that together? Yeah, so, you know, in those days, we were really just figuring out as we went. By the time uh, we got to dzone.com and really had evolved from Java Lobby, um, we had much more of a, a process and a, and a plan in place. And so, you know, we saw what places, you may remember dig.com mm. um, and the early days of Reddit, and they were beginning to try to provide value for uh, developers. And what we saw was, well, they were really underserving that particular uh, market. And so we decided to build something like that that could integrate into our large network and be able to to provide value that way as well, to accelerate our reach. Um, and so as we grew the company from being two guys on a couch to a company of five or 10, um, you know, we had to begin to introduce uh, more process. Mm -hmm. um, but still, we, we became very, we were still very agile as we, as we iterated on the things that we were doing. That's, that's what I was going to ask. And you, it, you answered perfectly. I was wondering if, you know, that was a thing then already, you know, being agile is, you know, a lot of development is and um, how you all did that if, if you were it or not, which, you know, obviously you were. And I guess with putting stuff like that together, that seems like the best way to go because you're always kind of building and testing and coming back and getting approval, you know, and, and getting feedback. Did you also solicit feedback from folks that were in Java Lobby and then and then in the D Zone community also on the on the product and then help shape it based on their feedback. Yeah, on the D when by the time we got to D Zone, we absolutely did. We had built up a, a community of really active contributors that that we used to uh, provide feedback when we were starting to look at new publications we wanted to launch or uh, new features we wanted to add to the website, that sort of thing. And so. Um, yeah, as we grew and scaled the business and got more organized about it, um, you know, we started to solicit more feedback from the people that we were serving rather than just, you know, going by what our gut feeling was that day on the couch. Right, yeah, which <clears throat> still has value, but yeah, it's nice to nice to hear, you know, whatever you get, you know, real user feedback, especially there because it's such like I say it's it seems like such a focused user community. Um that too, I imagine if, if you're not doing that in that space and really, I guess other spaces too, but, um, for developers that they, they won't be there anymore, I guess. Right. If it's, if it's not a, a place for them to go or a product for them to use. Yeah, it's really, you know, you've got to provide value first and foremost. And so you have to build an audience and then the monetization beyond follows that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we were really very focused on building, a uh, site that was useful for us and then useful for others. Uh, and so as long as we focused on delivering great value to developers, uh, we found that they were willing to uh, participate in the community and then continue to be able to provide a livelihood for us. Uh, but it's really, it, it was really quite symbiotic uh, in that type of community. And anytime you're trying to build the community of developers, particularly one that want to, you know, where you're trying to make money in building that community or building a publication, your your primary focus must be on delivering value to them first. Gotcha. And that, I mean, that sounds like, uh, you know, from being in college to then leading a company, um, a, a good, you know, lesson learned and, and something to pass along for others of it, you know, and, and, I heard you mention, you know, you started with what would work for us. And then as it grows and scales and, you know, becomes obvious that, it, that it's growing and then you evolve the company, um, focusing on, on the customers thing. How, how did you find the transition, um, from being on the team to helping, you know, lead the company and, and you know, as developing, you know, at a, at a pretty young age? Yeah, it's a it's an interesting thing. It all it happened over you know in the early days. It happened over so many years that I don't know that uh, necessarily recognized it. Um, and we were really figuring it out as we went. And uh, you know, 
some of the, you know, if we talk about lessons learned, right, the, um, you know, figuring out as you go has its uh, pluses and minuses. Um, and certainly we could have, uh, we probably would have stumbled fewer times along the way over the years um, had we been able to incorporate some experience from uh, other people who were subject matter experts, particularly around uh, the organization and um, people and those types of things, right? Or being able to bring in experienced people into the team. Um, you know, we we went we had a lot of ups and we had a lot of downs as we figured things out along the way. Um, and so that you know, there there are probably easier ways to do it than than the ways we did, but it worked for us. Yeah, I was going to say it, it. It got done, and you you all did it. I mean, it's it's pretty awesome. So it, it sounds like that's that's kind of a nugget too. Would you suggest if if possible, if you have the resources to when you're starting to build momentum, when you're starting to build something, um, or it's already grown and it's already you know of looking at okay, let's let's bring someone in that's kind of been either in this space or just or just is it more just in business in general? No, I think it's important to you have to f- bring in the right people that are at the size that you're at. Right. Oh, yeah. And so I, I think there's a, you know, and they have to fit with you and your other founders in particular. Um, and I think it's, you know, one, I think it's important for everybody to be on the same page about um, everybody's goals. Sure. Right. And so particularly as you, you know, are you guys there to build a nice lifestyle business? Are you there to build a business that you can grow to sell? Are you um, there to build a business that's going to be a business for life and be handed down to your children? And all of those are reasonable answers to the question of what you're in it to do, right? Mm, right. Um, but it's important. And that the answer to that question may change as well, right? And so I think it's uh, as long as everybody stays – you know, I think one of the most important things I would say is that everybody, one, you have to have trust and two, you have to have communication. Um, and so the people that you bring on in the early days in particular have to be people that you trust very uh, implicitly. Um, and one of the things that I have leaned in heavily in my uh, people logic is transparency. And so with the people that I brought in uh, in the early days here, I share a much higher percentage of information with them than I perhaps would have in the past. But it helps build that uh, that trust and makes them feel comfortable with where we are and push even harder as we move forward. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I, I know you've seen it and I've, I've definitely seen it on every lessons learned at the end of a project or from my previous public safety life and after action report communication is in some facet always there as an area for improvement, you know, whether it's too much or too little, or we didn't understand to your point, like does everybody know the goals or what are the objectives we're trying to get to collectively? Um, so that's a, a, a great point. And, and the transparency I think is, is awesome. You know, of you as a, as a leader to, to open up like that. Cause it is a challenge you know, if, if you're in an organization, you're not getting a lot of information or it's kind of, well, you know, you hear a lot of, well, we'll talk about that, you know, separately and, and you're kind of, everybody didn't have the right picture, right? The, the whole picture, kind of the why to borrow kind of a, a Simon Sinek thing or, you know, other mm-hmm. philosophies, but, you know, folks aren't tied in. It, it's also kind of a morale thing, I would think. I think it's great that you're open to sharing so much information because it, it just keeps people feeling included. Um, you know, and, and really does that. So that's, that's pretty awesome to hear. Well, the most important thing is that everybody's rowing in the same direction. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and to be clear, I think the, you know, the amount of transparency probably varies as you, um, you know, as the company scales, there are certainly times where too much, not everybody is able to handle, uh, really high degrees of transparency. It causes fear and panic in some cases, if it's not back to communication, if it's not communicated clearly. Right. And so, you know, as the, as a leader, you have to recognize that as the, the company scales, you realize where you are on that transparency and trust scale and make sure that you're communicating at the level that's appropriate for the company that you are at right now. 
uh, and make sure you don't get too far out ahead of your skis as you, as you scale. That's a great, um, you know, kind of situational awareness factor, you know, or self-awareness. That's, that's a good, a great point. So, so how long, um, were you with, um, D zone and then, you know, with that talking about some of those lessons learned that you've carried over to people logic. Um, so how long were you with, uh, D zone? So we, uh, we started, I, I got together with my partner, Rick back in, uh, 2001 and, um, we sold the company in October of 2017, and then I left in May of 2019. So uh, I guess that's 18 years. Wow. Give or take. <laughs> wow. So it was a, you know, it was a long journey, Kevin. It was, sure. <laughs> it was a long journey, um, filled with a lot of uh, a lot of excitement and positives, and you know, we we started working together in a downturn that, you know, in economic basis is very similar to what we're seeing today. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, you know, not the same in the context of, well, we can't even leave our apartments at homes, but, right. um, from an economic downturn perspective, you know, and jobs lost and those sorts of things, very similar, but, um, and, you know, through another downturn in 2008 and each of those gave us opportunities to, create something that uh the world needed and that our audience needed and and so i think that that's you know even while we it can be challenging to find the inspiration during these times uh the these types of events tend to be a forcing function in terms of creativity and innovation and so you know i think for all those people that are looking out, you know, wondering whether this is the time, you know, there may be an idea that wasn't relevant or didn't have the legs, uh, because the world wasn't ready six months ago that maybe it is now, uh, because the dynamics in the world have changed, particularly in how, uh, businesses and consumers interact and how they buy and how marketplaces work and all those things. And so I think it's a, it's an opportunity for those that are wondering whether it's a time to start a business that maybe this may be a good time. That, that's a great point. And, and, you know, one of the things I was wondering is, you know, is there an ideal time versus like you did finding, you know, a couple of times where it's not an <laughs> ideal time, but finding a solution that, you know, people want and need. So really that the timing obviously has factors, but if you can provide, you know, a useful product resource, you know, something, it, it sounds like you can still be successful if you focus on it and get that niche. And I think like, you know, for the, the space I'm in, in healthcare and, and in what you see everywhere, uh, like telemedicine, telehealth now, which isn't mm-hmm. brand new, right. But you know, a catalyst when you can't be together, I guess there's no better catalyst for telemedicine or telehealth than when you can't be together. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's, well, and that was telemedicine was on its way. Right. But it mm-hmm. wasn't, uh, it wasn't growing at anything exponential until something like this, right? Because why not? Um, and that's, I, you know, I think there's, there is never, I don't know that there's necessarily ever a bad time to start a business. I think, you know, it depends on your idea and whether you've researched the market and you understand what it is that, you know, who you're trying to serve and whether there's a need there and somebody's willing to buy what you have. Um, it's certainly possible. It's as dangerous to be too early as it is to be too late. Right. Uh, Um, and so, you know, I think there's, there's never really a a good time or a bad time to, to start a business. It, you know, it's whether you have the, uh, desire and the willingness to, to take a risk and to, um, to be able to, uh, to work your way through that. And then again, back to deciding, what type of business you'd like to, to have, right. Um, is because not every business needs to be a hundred million dollar of recurring revenue software business or a billion dollar of recurring revenue. It it has to meet the needs of the, of what you are trying to achieve. And so that, that may be a, a consulting business that, that has you, uh, covering your expenses, but it gives you the freedom to be your own boss Hmm. and to spend more time with your family. And, 
you know, whether you want to be able to, to, uh, be able to stay home and do your, the school with your children, that's a different, <laughs> <Right. question>. but <laughs> <laughs> for those of us with three children running around, um, that may not be the life goal that we aimed for, but, um, right. you know, so I, I think, you know, the timing is very much dependent on each individual person and, and really depends on, um, just what you are trying to, what you're trying to achieve and whether you've got a great idea. And if you have what you think is a great idea, figure out how to make it happen. And that may be working on it at night. It may be, uh, starting a great podcast. It could be, um, building a website, but there's, there's never a, very rarely is there a bad time, uh, as long as you understand the risks and the other people that are involved with you understand the risks. That's great. Great point. And, and, and honestly for, um, my first podcast was called between the slides. Now it's people process progress. Um, it, for me, it was exactly a lifetiming thing, getting out of the on-call responder life, but I used to teach and travel and going, Oh, I can sit here and still give people my two cents or give them a prep for this class. I used to teach and, you know, throw it out there. Um, and it's interesting, you know, hearing you talk about both, you know, a problem that you're trying to solve or what's fulfilling to you plus what's good for others. Um, cause you know, particularly in this space, everyone looks at, Oh, Joe Rogan or other huge NPR, right? Those are the, the, the meccas, but to your point, like that's, in the podcast world to me, like the hundred million dollar business, which is cool and great for them, but it doesn't really help you realistically focus on what you're doing. Cause it's so mm-hmm. lofty o- other than going, Oh, that was a good tip. Let me, let me use some of that. Or, you know, you learn from every little bit, but it's a great point of, of just looking at, you know, what do you want to do? How do you want to make a difference? And um, I think now again, and with now, now that we are past the mail in CD of internet, accessibility and the insane bandwidth we have. Um, and again, being a mid forties guy, I'm, I'm never not amazed by the technology we have that, you know, our kids are just like, that's just life. You know, it should, we should just always have a hundred megabytes. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Oh, why is the Wi-Fi <laughs> sucking today? Dad? It's, uh, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think it's really interesting because no matter what you choose to do, life is too short not to be doing something that you're passionate about. And so, you know, if you can supplement what you're doing with, um, you know, being excited about a side project or that you quit your day job to go full into a project, there's, you have to do the things that light you up. And so when you're looking at, you know, what do I want to do next? What do I want to do from starting a business? It has to be something that you're personally connected to that you can be passionate about and that every day you can wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to figure this out today and I'm going to build a great business. And then because you have to be able to inspire and motivate other people to join you. And so you have to be very passionate about what you're doing so that you can bring other people in with that same passion so that they tell other people about it. And that's the way that you get a, a thriving business. I imagine that's something you've seen for, you know, in the industry in general of, you know, businesses that do start and they, they gather folks or start to, but they, you can tell they don't have the passion. So you can kind of get a read for that. I imagine that's uh, a, a challenge. And, and I imagine just the variables of, you know, why someone did or didn't start something or stay with something or something like that. So that's a, that's a great point of, you know, your passion inspires others, which I think is a great, you know, when folks want to be part of something because of like your model and you, you know, not, not just a thing. That's a pretty awesome thing. So for, you know, for, for 18 years, you know, you're passionate and, and had D zone and then, um, you know, time to look at people logic dot AI. So from, from a lot of the lessons learned from starting that up, um, from, looking at what's, you know, what's this, this product and this, this solution, um, from, from, you know, all your years of experience, what were some things that you were thinking and, and headed toward people logic, um, that you wanted to make sure you were focused on kind of like you had early on for giving developers a place, but looking at, you know, cause it's a, a manager focused solution, right. To help folks and, and lead their people and, and, and other things and we'll get into that as well. But, um, what were you thinking as you look toward your kind of next passion project with people logic? Yeah, great question. And so, you know, with PeopleLogic, what we were 
there were a couple of things, you know, back to, to lessons learned is one, I knew I wanted from the start to be surrounded by uh, people that would inspire me. Um, I also knew that I didn't know everything. And so I needed to bring in people who were going to be subject matter experts, whether that's around um, the people that knew more about the human resources world or the people analytics world, or whether they were experts in sales and marketing and figuring out how to, to grow uh, a business without spending huge amounts of money, um, or whether it's finding uh, great developers that are can build the tool with me to, to really take it to the next level. And so, you know, those were the things I knew from the beginning that I could do this business, I could launch this business and have it grow faster than the 18 years it took me on the last one hmm. by surrounding myself with great people from the start uh, and um, and being able to really take that from the from the ground up, right? And so I think the other piece is also recognizing, you know, we're in a world now with cloud tools and this we'll come around to an important piece here. Sure. Uh, as we were building our last business, we did a lot of things uh, ourselves. We either, you know, ran our own servers or we ran, um, you know, ran uh, different tools that, that we self-hosted and self-managed. And in today's world, you don't need to do that, right? Uh, and so we, in this time around, I felt very confident in leveraging cloud tools for a variety of different things. And so, you know, one of the things that we noticed at DZone and Devada as we uh, went through the years was that there was lots of information that existed within the tools that the team was using, um, but it was largely locked into those tools, and it wasn't. Uh, it didn't. We didn't make it easy for people to be able to leverage the the data that was in those tools to be able to manage our teams better and to build the company better and to be focused on growth. And, you know, we tried to build dashboards and, um, you know, invest in tools like Tableau and that didn't really get us where we needed to go either. That gave you a point in time snapshot of where we were going, but it wasn't predictive. It wasn't prescriptive. And so I began to see that there was this need, uh, this ability to predict which, uh, teams and managers were going to be successful and to be able to help keep them on the right path in being successful so that we could provide them with uh, this beacon that would give them the ability to uh, stay on the right path and continue to help the company grow. Wow. I mean, data-driven solutions, right? And, and, and not just for the, hey, here's your data points, what are you doing? But really to, to both help performance, help the company, but also help the people themselves be more efficient, right? Like, here's your data, here's what you're doing or not doing at these, you know, at these times or um, you know, the analytics of, of the person. And so how, how do folks or, you know, managers, leaders use that? Um, Cause it sounds like they can you know, be data driven decisions, not just, you know, what if I have data on how many calls for service we had in this area, we know we need this many ambulances or on a project, you know, we have this many faults. So we need these, these things, but it sounds like it's a, it's a very holistic look at the data with the person in the middle of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's you hit the nail on the head. So it, it isn't, you know, data for data's sake is, is useless. And so most companies are aggregating all this data and have no idea what to do with it. Uh, we're also not trying to uh, have managers capture all this data so that they can be keeping an eye on their, uh, on their employees, right? You've probably right. seen these articles. You've probably seen all these articles about companies that are now, you know, taking random screenshots of their um of their employees desktops uh mm. to make sure they're being productive that to me that is disrupt dis destructive of a culture uh within the organization and that's not what we're trying to do right so right. what we do is we take you know in aggregate the information that organizations are gathering already from their teams and apply people science and people analytics to uh their personalities that we're generating, uh, their strengths, and then use that to build uh, prescriptive recommendations for the manager about 
how to uh, better manage Jim or Sally. Um, and then be able to push the insights and the recommendations to where their manager, John, is going to need them. And that might be within Slack when they're headed into a meeting. It might be in their email on Friday afternoon when they're getting ready to build their status email for the team. Um, it, it's really about providing just-in-time insights uh, for teams so that they can stay on the right path. And really being, you know, the person, it's people focused. Right. And so it's really around that, uh, that idea that you can't have a team without the people and for companies to be, uh, their most high performing, you need to be able to, to have a team of great people all moving in the same direction. That, that makes total sense. I mean, and convenient you're on the people process progress podcast so you know word, word one fits uh, but yeah I, I, I was talking to somebody else um earlier today as well and, and talking about the whole notion of right if you're not in the office you're not productive kind of old school thoughts um which probably everybody has seen and then and then this shift of you know no one's in the office or very few and companies are still going. Yes. Some have taken a hit. A lot have taken a hit, but you know, with our technology and everything that we're using like now, I mean, us, you know, on Skype recording this and um, just the ability to get work done, but it's really based on the work getting done, not the physical location of the person. You know, I think like I've, I've seen that in, you know, not, not that long ago, really. Um, and I'm sure others have too. Um, but now I'll be interested to see, how the whole landscape changes and the balance of telework and things that it sounds like wherever my, my teams are and wherever I am as a leader, um, because this plugs into a lot of major platforms, right? Collaborative mm -hmm. uh, software and, and systems that people use now. Yep, absolutely. And so, you know, we're, we've seen Gallup calling it and we're calling it the, this next normal and it won't look the same as it has in the past for how teams function. Some people are going to be better suited to be in an office and some people are going to be better suited to work from home. And so what we help companies do is be able to understand their people and their managers uh, in such a way that you can help guide them along which way is going to work better for Jim. Was he most productive uh, during uh, when he was working from home or does he tend to work too many hours outside of, uh, you know, what's standard? And that leads him to be uh, suffering from burnout. Um, or does he just tend to work from uh, 10 to 4 in the morning and that's his best time? So, you know, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, we're never going back to everyone being in the offices. Mm -hmm. um, I just, at least I don't think so. Um, I think the world has moved to a place where we understand that people are able to be productive wherever they are. And, um, that with the right tools and the right infrastructure, you're able to, to see productivity and growth um, no matter where they work. Had, had you before um, the actual people logic uh, platform was built out in, in your, your previous life or, or the years leading up to it, had you kind of used some of this on your own when, where you just kind of gathered your own data or, or pulled stuff together and, and kind of, you know, modeled this? Not, not uh, with the same platform you had now, but, you know, just on your own or with the platform, uh, early platform. You know, this became more of a, an entrepreneur's intuition more so than a, a model beforehand. Um, we were never really a company that uh, embraced uh, work from home or remote work, um, although we did have a, you know, a fairly large team of uh, remote engineers around the globe. But, um, you know, this really became more of a, I think that there's something here. And as I dug into it more and began to, to understand this world and this market, um, that got me more and more excited. And so people uh, analytics is this really interesting space where, uh, it's primarily dominated as a world that where really, really large companies are, uh, able to take advantage of all the data that they've captured and their, um, they're using it to do all sorts of modeling and predictive analysis, but they're focusing primarily on HR data. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the other tools in the people analytics space are focused on enterprises. And that can be a great business. But what we wanted to be able to do was build a solution that used tools that 
your employees are actually using so that nobody had to generate, you know, new, install new tools or gather data from other places. We wanted to leverage the data that was already being captured and wanted to be able to make it affordable and um, available to small and medium businesses, primarily tech companies that were in growth mode, uh, like the kind of company that I had before. Mm. And so that was our, you know, to the point we talked about earlier about finding your niche and, you know, being able to identify the piece. It may not be a trillion dollar market, but it might be a hundred billion or a $300 billion market. And so, you know, our niche is building a people analytics platform for uh, small and medium businesses. Nice. So with, with, with the managers and it, and it plugs into their systems um, and being able to get kind of a proactive report, right? So if I'm a, mm-hmm. if I'm a, a leader, you know, and, and probably a lot of folks have this, which I would imagine contributed to your, you know, realization, oh, this, this is a need. You know, there's different systems that don't talk to each other in the same organization, but there's stuff being reported to them in there. So is it, you know, as a, as a leader, as a manager um, using people logic do you like how how does it work as a, as a manager when it comes in there from the standpoint of you know I want to get like a weekly update of my team or I can just go in there and check or is it kind of a combination of that so you can have you know a combination regular tempo? of it yeah yeah a combination of it so you can go into it at any time but you're also going to get your uh, a daily email at the end of every day and a weekly email um, next week we're going to be rolling out. Uh, our first Slack bot where you're going to be able to leverage the data from Slack uh, and also where we're going to be pushing those, you know, you're going to be able to start your day by getting uh, a recap of yesterday from PeopleLogic. Oh, wow. And then on the go, you're going to be able to talk with our natural language insights engine to be able to get details about your team. Uh, maybe you want to see how the, uh, your team is performing based on their personality traits and you're going to be able to see that on the go. Uh, and so that's rolling out next week, uh, along with an adjustment to our, to our pricing down to, to $49 a team to make it even more affordable and attractive to, to small and medium businesses. Wow. That, that's awesome. You mentioned some of the analytics, people in analytics and systems, um, HR focused. And it, when you were speaking of it, it I, I kind of thought that direction, but also wondered of, you know, the folks you bring on the team and with the human resources aspect. And I imagine, you know, the, the other looking at people, have you found that folks that have gone to school for HR or have worked in the HR space um, that, that the trend, because it sounds kind of like an IT HR hybrid focus right that, that they're doing that in school more and then or just the industry is doing that more uh the industry is moving that way and so you know linkedin just recently did a survey of their audience or their hr professionals uh, last year or early this year uh and people analytics was one of the the four or five key trends to be looking at for for 2020 mm. um and, and into 2021 so you know HR professionals are having to be more data driven uh, and more technical. Um, they still aren't to a place where they have the budget authority to be able to put these systems into place uh, in most cases, oh, but gotcha. they, they do need to be as their responsibilities grow and they're focused on, uh, you know, not just uh, providing compliance and, and benefits, but being able to be focused on, growing the employee experience and having that encompass both the engagement of the employee, but also the performance of the employee and the productivity. Um, they need more tools to be able to uh, stay on top of that and to be effective in their jobs. So no, it's not something that's necessarily uh, driven towards uh, HR professionals being the ones that are leading this in large orgs. It's, a lot of finance of people, a lot of uh, analysts, those types of things. But as uh, it becomes an important component of uh, HR's job to understand how their teams are behaving and how they're performing and um, have that be incorporated to the culture of the company, um, they're going to have to be play a more active role in people analytics. I was going to so say, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
No, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say it's, it sounds like with, again, people focused, um, but, but having this data, but also can, particularly to the point of providing insight into burnout, you know, for mm-hmm. the, the hard chargers that are kind of hard chargers to a fault, you know, where it's like work, work, work. It sounds like an all, it could also, you know, a, a byproduct, probably not accidental is, you know, employee retention, um, obviously work-life balance, but it, it seems, you know, which, which is right up, you know, the, the HR and finance alley, right? So, so turnover and, and things like that. It sounds like that's a great, you know, a byproduct of being able to look better into your, your people and what they're doing and help, help steer them in the right direction. No, and that's, you know, one of the things that we wanted from day one with People Logic was to be able to build a platform that didn't forget about the culture. And so we wanted to make sure that the insights and the recommendations that we we're providing to teams uh, was not counter to the culture that they were building inside the company. And I think that's really a, it's a very important part that, you know, the, the culture of a company, particularly when done right, um, can really help accelerate it. It's part of what recruits people. It's part of what keeps people. Uh, and so we want, we fully believe that it's possible to incorporate this data driven management into how companies run, uh, and still maintain a positive company culture. Is so is that with with that focus? Um, if you know for the the clients you have, so you have a client and you're helping them get started with this, is that part of the discussion you all have of being able to share? You know, here's ways we found that this is integrated um, in the organization that it's beneficial, um, that that is helpful, and here's ways to the point you know earlier of data just for data or data because you, you know you could use data and it, and it and it's a negative effect, right? Look at what you're not doing, this kind of thing, but all in how you use it. But do you also kind of help strategize how to incorporate the tool? And also it sounds like it's not just a tool, it's kind of the mindset and philosophy to help those, those organizations. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, one of the things that every customer gets a, a couple weeks in is a session with our team about the recommendations that we've generated, some of the insights that we've generated for them. Uh, and we talk about how to best put those insights into practice. Um, and so oh, nice. we, we're there to kind of handhold you as you get the insights. And some of them are very uh, straightforward, like, hey, you really should be having a one on one with your team. Uh, others of them are, you know, hey, we noticed that Jim is uh, working more than usual outside of his normal time you know, you may want to consider giving him a half day or maybe this engineer um, hasn't been participating in code reviews. And so each of these are different types of recommendations that, you know, we want to help the, at least our primary contact. And we're certainly happy to talk to their managers as well that to help them guide them in this uh, conversation. But we want to help every company that comes on board to put into practice uh, the things that we recommend and do that in a healthy way. So we're going to encourage them to, to have a conversation with us that says, okay, here's how we would recommend you have this conversation, but you know, let's talk about what it looks like inside your culture as well. It, it is a, a project manager who is usually probably on your client side, right? Working with a vendor um, coming in. It's, it's great to hear. And I found that it's so helpful early. I mean, relationships are, are really everything to, you know, between me as the PM on a particular project and then my counterpart or the point person, you know, uh, with the vendor or the solution that we bring in to really get that relationship going well. And and I find it really valuable when, um, you know, our, our partners, because I look at it at that, right? And, and you've probably seen it where sometimes that initial relationship is rocky and, you know, there's your team and my team and not just, hey, it's one team, let's work together, that kind of stuff. But but the the openness and the willingness to provide examples and lessons learned, I think, is invaluable and, and it and helps, you know, I know it helps me, but helps organizations really adopt and build that partnership and understand, um, you know, here not not just here's the product, you know, good luck. You know, it, it sounds that holistic piece, that relationship building provides so much value in both, yes, getting a product to work well, but also, you know, with looking at here's some some real examples of where we've seen improvement or, you know, to your point, the the actual strategies for, you know, teams and things that that sounds like a really helpful uh, approach and, and, and a great open view of it. 
Well, we hope so. And, uh, you know, we come from an enterprise software world where the relationship was a big component of the selling process and the retention process. And so, you know, we've tried to bring a little bit of that sort of that white glove treatment to our SMB world um, as we've launched this company. Nice and and looking um, definitely looking at the at the website the People Logic website um, looking at engineers sales and support you know under under some of the things so but but it it sounds like it's it could really work for anyone that's using you know that's that's inputting data in systems that that leaders can then look at um, you know throughout those those you know small to medium businesses or, or folks that are growing. Um, fits each, each of those. How how did the focus, um, you know, look at the engineer sales and support? How do, how does People Logic look at those those kind of three categories in particular? Yeah, so those are categories of people who tend to use a lot of tools, uh, mm-hmm. and so there are also teams where the managers are probably looking at a variety of different tools in any given day. Um, it. That just and we tend to clump our recommendations together depending on the type of team as well. So we're not going to make a recommendation um, that's better suited for an engineer to a salesperson. Mm. Um, But it is there are plenty of recommendations and insights that you can capture that are uh, applicable to any team, uh, no matter what the type. And so, yeah, it's any company that is managing people. Uh, whether they're in one team or whether they're in 10 teams uh, could benefit from a tool like PeopleLogic. And it's really just about, uh, you know, giving the managers the uh, and the executives and everybody is our longer term goal is to be able to uh, democratize this, the access to the data that we're providing to the employees as well. Oh, wow. um, but the, the ability to, uh, lead from the front foot and have the insights they need when and where they, they need them so that they can go into any situation prepared um, and not stumble uh, because they lack the information to make the right decision. That, that makes great sense. There was, um, I was fortunate to work, I was a, an EMS planning captain in the, the city. Um, so did some field work, but mostly like special event planning and um, scheduling for the system. And so similar to kind of using data to look at performance, but looking at like call times and how long you were here and, you know, how many of this did you do? It's it, it definitely, you know, the times one, if, if you don't have that in real time, cause we would have to pull data and, you know, have these huge spreadsheets and do all this. And it's, it's neat, but again, starting to look at how do I do this? Not just right before your review, you know, <laughs> when it's yes. a proactive tool for everyone, um, and that was a tough balance. And, and it is even, you know, even with all the data that that, you know, discussion again of, of keeping the people, the person rather central of, you know, sometimes just the data does have to speak for itself, you know, in, in some discussions with the person in front of you. Uh, but it, it, it is an interesting balance of, of using that and, and how they're working and, and having those. And I guess that's where their kind of relationship comes in as well. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, we're really, we're focused on, you know, long term being able to provide a tool that takes the bias out of these interactions. And so too many managers are biased towards their gut feelings or, uh, and sometimes that can be good, but in a lot of cases, it can also be bad, particularly when you're dealing with recency bias or you're friends with someone. Um, And we want to be able to provide uh, managers and teams and employees the ability to have an honest conversation, whether it's in a one-on-one or whether it's in a review, uh, without having to spend hours and hours, uh, you know, getting prepared, right? And so that's our, we want to make the whole process uh, more effective um, because right now companies are still doing performance reviews quarterly if they're lucky, uh, annually at a must. And Right. They're still basing their comp increases on these reviews. Mm-hmm. But the fundamental process of these performance reviews is broken. Um, and so, you know, we believe that through using the data that's in these tools, we can provide uh, companies with a better view into how their teams are performing and uh, have that fit in with their culture and be able to, to build higher performing teams. That sounds great. Now we'll just have to 
get an easy button for how to have that <laughs> review when you are the leader and your friend is working for you. <laughs> and, and exactly. you're sitting there. It's, that's, that's, uh, I'll tell you what, that's when I was in the Navy and, you know, you promote and not everybody promotes at the same time or in private industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, boy, that's, that's a challenge. <laughs> even, even it with is. some, some, you know, some, some clear data and stuff, but, it, but at least having that there is, it takes, you know, some of the argument away because it's not, to your point, like I, I can't bias this because it's actually your work, not exactly. a bullet point that I wrote about you. you know, exactly. Or something. that they wrote about themselves, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, <laughs> that's true. The, the age old evaluate yourself. The self review. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. I think we were uh, talking the other day about the Luke Skywalker's performance review. So yes. Folks are listening. <laughs> just look up like, Luke Skywalker performance review meme or something. And for me showing my age again, I don't know if it's a meme, it's actually a comic strip. So would people consider that a meme? I don't think so. It's a, just a comic strip, I guess, <laughs> but it's interesting. Uh, these, days, I, these days, if it's on the internet, I'm not sure there's a difference. Is there? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So did you get too specific? Uh, it's just <laughs> funny. So folks should, so should folks should check it out. So for, uh, for us coming up on an hour, um, good stuff. I think for, for the folks that are out there, I think it was very helpful to learn. Um, you know, there, there's not necessarily a perfect time to start something that you're passionate about, you know, like you mentioned, which was really great, really, really well said. What, what would you say as far as someone, you know, to make progress They're they're just getting started in a space or they're kind of working into space um, to get them, you know, to where you got to be successful, to build a company um, so they can make progress and then kind of a second to that is what is your overall hope for for people logic to help um, people and organizations to make progress so to your first point you know and particularly if we're talking about people looking to to start a business you know i think you know one identify a need and identify a market um, but two don't let perfect be the enemy of good mm. enough right and be you know be get something out to market and then iterate on it um, so that you can make shifts as you see what the feedback is from people who are actually using it. It'll benefit you way more than sitting there, uh, you know, trying to figure out exactly what the market wants or what your mom wants or your dad wants. Hmm. Uh, get it out in the hands of real people and don't be afraid of the feedback that comes um from those real users use that to improve your product uh, so that's what I would that's what I would uh, advise there isn't ever a, a bad time or a good time to start a business as long as you uh, understand the risks and you understand what it is that you're aiming for and um, you know and then just build something get it out there and then keep iterating um, that's always served me well nice. uh, for people logic you know we want to be the tool uh, that companies uh, that are, you know, small businesses turn to, to, to be able to keep their teams on track and, and uh, performing optimally. And we want to uh, be able to bring this world of data-driven management and people analytics and apply that to, uh, to this small business world and be able to help companies provide a great employee experience. And that starts by uh, building you know, helping the manager understand their people better uh, and building high performing teams. And so that's, that's really, we want to be the, the choice when people think about, Hey, I need to get insights about my teams so that they can keep performing well as we grow. Um, and we want to be that choice. That's a great, great thing to focus on and help with. So if, for, for folks that are interested, um, how could they connect with you? And then how could they connect with um, people logic? Where should they go to do that? Absolutely. So they can always email me, Matt at PeopleLogic.ai, uh, or Twitter at MP Schmid, S C H M I D. Uh, that's a long story about why the T is missing on that one. But gotcha. uh, <laughs> tweet him, and you, you can, can. He'll tell you <laughs> exactly. Um, and then, if you're interested in PeopleLogic, uh, go to the website at uh, PeopleLogic.ai. That's awesome. Matt, thank you so much for, for your time, for being on the show, um, for the, for the work y'all are doing, you're focusing on. That's such a great, um, you know, a great, a great way to look at helping businesses grow and just, and really take care of people. Uh, it's just a, you know, a great model, I think for 
business in general and just, you know, for, for humans. And I think the, you know, again, I think all this technology, all the, all the data, all the systems we have um, can be used for so much good. Uh, and so, sometimes they're, you know, we've, we've seen all the stuff, the junk that's out there on, on the web and, and here and there. So it's great to hear about a product that's, you know, focuses on the people and pulling stuff together and, and helping everybody, uh, you know, make that, make that progress together and, as an organization. And, and it sounds like in the future individually as well. Absolutely. That's our goal. And uh, thank you so much for having us today. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for, for listening. Um, again, reach out to, to Matt. Um, we'll have links in the description uh, and the show notes. Um, so you all can click on those if you choose to go to iTunes, Spotify, Blueberry, all the different platforms. Um, again, please, if you'd, you'd like to, please subscribe, uh, give us a rating, um, and then we'll look forward to hearing more in the future uh, about how PeopleLogic's going and, and kind of what's happening there. It's very exciting. So thank you again, uh, everybody. Take care.